Welcome back, everybody. If you're just joining us, uh, I'm Luke Menzel, CEO of the Energy Efficiency Council, and it is now my great pleasure to welcome four genuine leaders in Australia's energy and climate debate for today's panel. Dr. Cassandra Goldie is CEO of the Australian Council of Social Service, the national peak body for the community sector and an advocate for tackling poverty and inequality. Uh, prior to joining ACOS, Cassandra held senior roles in both the not-for-profit and the public sectors at local, national and international levels. Welcome, Cass. Hi. Ken Morrison is the Chief Executive of the Property Council of Australia, the National Representative of Australia's property sector. Ken is also a Director of the Green Building Council of Australia, Deputy Chair of the Business Coalition for Tax Reform. And Ken, you and I both have the honour of being Directors of the Australian Sustainable Built Environment Council. Welcome. We do indeed. Good day, Luke. Now, we were disappointed that Ennis Willocks has been called away due to an urgent personal matter, but I couldn't think of a better ring-in today. Uh, Tenant Reid, Head of Climate, Energy and Environment Policy at Australian Industry Group. For those of you that don't know Tenant, he's been driving much of AI Group's engagement in this space for over a decade and is well-known and well-respected among energy and climate advocates around the country. Welcome, Tenant. It's great to be with you, and I'll see if I can sustain the live tweeting. <laughs> Very good. Tenant, Tenant and I were talking uh, before the panel and uh, uh, he has an ability to, I believe, Tenant, uh, a live tweet while on panels, but not necessarily while you're, ta you're talking. Is that right? Yeah, I'm, I'm probably not going to develop that uh, extended ability today. Okay. And uh, finally, Alison Rowe is Chief Executive Officer and Executive Director of the Australian Energy Foundation, a leading community organisation focused on scaling up solutions for Australia's energy transition. And Alison, you are formerly the Global Executive Director for Sustainability at Fujitsu Limited, um, and you are currently Chair of Infrastructure Sustainability Council of Australia. Welcome, Alison. Great. Thanks to be here. All right. So we're going to check in with each of our leaders on today's panel. And Cass, I'm going to start with you. Um, I was really delighted to see uh, your, your final report, which, which the Energy Efficiency Council and a number of the organisations on, on this call signed on to last week, um, in which, along with 50 organisations, you released an ambitious plan to improve the energy efficiency of 440,000 social housing dwellings, 1.1 million low-income households and, and 360,000 rental properties. They are massive numbers. Why has ACOS made energy efficiency upgrades a central part of their advocacy for economic recovery. Look, thank you, Luke. Um, really great to be here. And um, I mean, look, take that. You know, if you're looking for consensus and broad-based support for something, um, I've not seen anything like what we're seeing in terms of getting behind this uh, proposal for investing in energy efficiency. So congratulations to the Energy Efficiency Council for, you know, the relentless dogged pursuit oh, of well. so important. Well, um, Cass, I, I can tell you for, as the CEO of the Energy Fair Council for five or six years now, I'm slightly in shock. <laughs> but, I mean, I, I know that energy efficiency is something that everybody can get behind, but, um, but the sheer level exactly. of uh, enthusiasm and support right now yeah. for this topic is, is absolutely incredible. It is. It's very, very encouraging. Look, you know, acknowledging Kelly Corp, my colleague, that who many know um, from ACOS and the um, COS colleagues that are, on, you know, in, involved in all of this work and many of our members as well. Um, look, the, <clears throat> this, this is... Um, a proposal that, you know, uh, it's time had come a long time ago, um, but there's no question for us. We think this is definitely worth investing in our collective effort and advocacy to try and get the investment over the line. There's no question, you know, in the environment we're in now, we need a very particular kind of economic stimulus um, where the jobs can be created very quickly, you know, the so-called shovel-ready um, investment fiscal levers that are really job rich, learning lessons from, you know, how we approach the last economic downturn is really crucial here. Um, and I'll come back to, you know, why back then there was a focus on energy efficiency and we should learn our lessons, um, but really get it right this time and, you know, do some transformative work as a result of that. 
Um, there's no question, you know, I'm delighted to see, as many of us are, that the OECD in its economic um, statement um, just a couple of weeks ago in giving its view of how Australia was travelling said, yep, we're going pretty well here in terms of the response on COVID. Um, in terms of next stage, there were three things that the OECD would recommend we do. Um, securing the social safety net, so raise the rate for good. Thank you, folks any of you on this call who can get, get behind increasing job seeker for long term, so vital. Um, and social housing, and of course these are related topics as you know, Lou, when it comes to mm. you know properties that people live in and investing in energy efficiency, top three. So there you go. Pre-COVID, there were 3 million people who were living below the poverty line. Um, we know um, that unemployment is the greatest risk in terms of you um, becoming um, deeply financially distressed. And of course, now we are waiting to see where we might get to in terms of the level of unemployment, um, depending on what the government does. Um, but there's no question that we should be doing everything we can to minimise the out-of-pocket costs for people on low and modest incomes. And after you look at what happens to housing cost, people's focus on energy bills is right. I mean, there's no question people on low income spend five times more of their income on energy bills than people on high incomes. Um, and um, as many of us are sitting here appropriately rugged up, um, we know that people on very low incomes don't use their heaters at all in the winter. Uh, they turn off their hot water systems, they go without meals and medicine, and even then, they're often still really struggling to pay their electricity bills. Um, and the health, both physical and mental health implications that are very serious, um, people's health deteriorates as a result of being exposed mm -hmm. to extreme temperatures, um, skipping meals and medicines, stress, social isolation, the shame of having to live in that kind of situation in a, a otherwise relatively wealthy country. Um, and we know that more people die in Australia from heat waves, from heat waves than from natural disasters. And in winter in Australia, more people die of the cold than in countries like Sweden. Mm -hmm. So yeah. this is a really human experience of why we are appropriately, doggedly obsessed with energy efficiency. <laughs> like um, yourself, Luke, um, you know, a big reason is we have very inefficient homes in, for a developed world. Most homes have an average of about 1.7 in terms of rating existing homes compared to the standard of six star. Um, we should be not allowing any new property to be built that isn't to the best energy efficiency standard, but we're so behind the eight ball with heavy reliance, of course, on a existing housing stock um, and people on low incomes are out there right now trying to find properties that are affordable for them and many of them will be at a very low standard when it comes to energy efficiency. Um, I'm sure you've all touched again on um, our um, desperate attempts to get consensus on the big system changes that we need to tackle carbon emissions. Um, we are on board with all of that. But it needs to be said that one of the most, um, if people say they care about energy bills, and many climate deniers say that, don't they? Um, if there was one um, investment that we could make to finally properly get energy bills down for people who struggle to pay them, it's investing in energy efficiency. You know, our, our work shows that if you invest between two to five grand in a retrofit, um, you could deliver energy savings on that bill for people in apartments of about $300 per year. And if you're in a house, about $1,200 per year. So bang for your buck, that's actually the biggest driver of getting those bills down. Um, you talked a lot about the, you know, the international energy agencies sort of backing in of this agenda. And I've touched on the OECD. You've heard a lot, I'm sure, about how jobs rich this is. Look, earlier this morning, Luke, I was in a, um, a gathering of people um, talking about local economic recovery. You know, big mm. country Australia, very diverse regional communities. Um, and and what, what do people need to be backing in right now? And we've said, let's back in investment that is actually can be tailored to local conditions. In other mm. words, great energy efficiency, jobs rich, and jobs that are suitable for local communities. So this is a real strength of this kind of investment. In contrast, may I say, to what is often seen as sort of big infrastructure 
you know, very expensive, some jobs in it, but very localised. And so I also think this has really got a strong focus in terms of the uh, quite correct obsession with um, jobs growth. Um, we're very worried about that, of course, um, but we're very worried also about people who for a long time potentially be on very low incomes. And with the kind of housing stock profile that we've got in Australia, um, the best thing we could do right now is get behind this energy efficiency package. We've got a detailed proposal worked up together haven't we luke we do indeed. But wants to deliver on it we're ready to go <laughs> very good thanks Gus. <laughs> look um uh, i'll go to you ken and um one of the things that has been incredibly heartening for me over the the last period of time is that there there have been um some some diverse coalitions coming together but also pulling in the same direction and 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 uh, the property council was was a, was a part of another group um, that uh, the Energy Efficiency Council and the Green Building Council and the many organisations that formed the Australian Sustainable Built Environment Council also backed in, um, which included a, a, a proposal which kind of complements what Cass was just talking about, about how we can really upgrade the energy performance of the commercial building sector with a, with a really significant $1 billion smart building fund. Um, do you want to just talk, talk to that and, uh, and exactly why um, like CAS at ACOS, the Property Council has identified energy efficiency as a, as a key plank of its uh, its plan for, for recovery in the commercial building sector. Yeah, thanks, Luke, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, look, I really agree with uh, the sentiment that, that CAS was putting out there. I mean, you know, the reason why we've put this forward as, as part of a broad range of things we need to do in Australia right now is because... It makes a lot of sense, and it makes a lot of sense in, in a number of different ways. One, it's a jobs machine. So for every million dollars of investment it's made, it, it you know supports uh, 15 jobs. So that's that's a pretty good multiplier. Uh, uh, two, as Cassie was just saying, that uh, what we need is, is, is jobs that can appear quickly here. So yes, we still do need to invest in long-term infrastructure and things like that. But the things that are going to save our bacon over the next six and 12 months are not going to be those things, they're going to be the shorter term things, the private sector delivery of, 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 of different activity, and that's going to support activity and jobs in the, in the near term. And the second, and the, the other thing is that, that, you know, this is, as we are a country and as we are a world which is grappling with the issues of climate change, we need to be looking at the least cost options here to, uh, to meet our Paris targets to to make our contribution. Uh, and that's where energy efficiency is, is a really important measure. Uh, we know that the built environment accounts for about a quarter of Australia's emissions. Uh, we know that many of the opportunities within the built environment are actually some of the least cost abatement opportunities uh, in the economy. So to marry these two ideas together, that let's, let's have uh, measures which create a stimulatory effect at the time we need that most, as well as making a very important contribution towards, uh, you know, a, a major challenge of our time, uh, just makes a lot of sense. Uh, you know, I think one of the the really uh, difficult things for policymakers to get their heads around when they look at the built environment is that it's tricky. It's not as simple as, uh, from a policy point of view, as as some other areas, because it involves so many different actors. You know, it involves literally every developer, every builder, every property owner, every every occupant of any house. Uh, you know, it's everybody from the, you know, the the most uh, disinterested homeowner to the most professional uh, property manager in the in the country. And and it's that marrying of all that that different those different uh, people who are involved in the decision making and finding the ways to motivate them uh, to, to deliver on these outcomes, which is a tricky bit. But what we uh, have put to governments is a number of proposals which would do that, which would create funds to support that professional end property sector as they advance uh, energy efficiency in, in, in those commercial property buildings. It would uh, have measures for existing homeowners to incentivise them to do what needs to be done in, in, their, in, in their dwellings. It would look at things like hospitals and education and social housing, uh, those necessary parts of, of social infrastructure and provide the incentive to accelerate energy efficiency in there. And it would also do um, 
provide that very important supportive policy of uh, which is really missing at the moment. So in housing, there's no measuring strict, there's no rating tool, which, which for a consumer allows them to understand how efficient or how sustainable a, a dwelling is. Uh, the Green Building Council is doing a lot of great work around uh, extending Green Star into housing. It's largely coming out to, from a development and new housing perspective, um, getting a lot of great take up there from the industry. Uh, that needs to be married with a, a simple rating tool that can work for everyday building owners, tenants that want to know how efficient, how sustainable their, their, their property is. It doesn't make any sense in a country where you can go and buy a fridge or a washing machine and you'd have a lot of confidence that it says five stars, it's really good. If it says two stars, it's a dog, mm. uh, but you can't make the biggest purchase of your life uh, and have that same information in front of you. So if there is a information gap there, that if that was filled, could drive so much change, could help people out who would like to do the right thing, but are not going to spend three hours on a, on a Wednesday night trying to work out what the hell doing the right thing is. So, so that is also another key recommendation that the group's made. Yeah, look, and you're absolutely right, Ken. It, and it goes to the, to the experience that, that our organisations have had with, with neighbours and, and the, the, the enabler that the transparency mm. around energy performance is for the, for the market. And, you know, it, it is regulation. We shouldn't shy away from that, but it's incredibly light, light touch regulation, that, that disclosure piece. And it's really about consumer protection as much as anything else. It's about, you know, uh, the people that are either, uh, uh, in this case, buying a home, um, knowing knowing what's on the tin and, and and having an understanding of of how much it's it's likely to cost them to to keep themselves warm in winter and, and cool in summer. Exactly. Well, uh, I might move on to you, you tenant, and um, uh, like all the other organisations on this panel, um, AI Group has been a very long-standing advocate for energy efficiency and energy productivity um, for your for your members. Um, uh, but look, this is an incredibly crowded space for the manufacturing sector. There's lots of ins and outs, lots of <laughs> whys and what have you. Um, as uh, demand for for uh, your members uh, collapses, um, both uh, locally and, and globally, but yet nevertheless, um, you've picked this up as a, as a key priority in terms of your engagement with, with government. Do you want to uh, unpack for us why, why energy efficiency and energy productivity just remains so crucial uh, for, for AI Group? Sure thing. And uh, it's it's terrific for uh, our group to be able to support this event today uh, on a topic that is vital for our members and for the wider community. Um, look, in essence, we, we're backing uh, and, and barracking for energy efficiency upgrades because they are a way to score five goals off one kick. Mm -hmm. And there are a few people who know less about football than me, but I'm told <laughs> I, that I would be a pretty that. impressive achievement. <laughs> um, you can grow jobs, you can cut costs, you can improve health, you can strengthen energy systems, and you can slash emissions at the same time. That's, that's pretty good. So look, our members are uh, businesses of all sizes, across many sectors. I'm gonna single out manufacturing within uh, that membership today. Businesses who make things have faced a lot of challenges in recent years from the end of um, passenger vehicle uh, assembly uh, in this country to the surge in power and gas prices that has only recently ebbed. Um, despite that, the manufacturing sector has grown strongly until now. So the initial phase of this pandemic has seen the steepest decline in AI Group's performance of manufacturing index uh, since we began collecting that data in 1992. That drop has slowed now, but absolute activity is weak. There's widespread apprehension about a second wave of economic impacts as demand and investment sag and existing work pipelines run dry. And if those gaps aren't filled, manufacturing will be shedding workers rather than absorbing those displaced from the tourism and travel sectors. Mm. Uh, it doesn't have to be that way. Governments are understandably cautious about the long-term burden of the debts that they are taking on to support the economy today. 
And that's why we should be prioritising those stimulus options that also have additional longer term payoffs. So energy efficiency upgrades loom very large there. Uh, there are opportunities, as we've all said, to use energy smarter across the economy, very much including within manufacturing. Uh, high energy prices in recent years have encouraged cost control steps, especially among larger and more energy intensive businesses. But there are lots of options left to implement, especially those for SMEs or with slightly longer paybacks or involving less familiar technologies like high temperature heat pumps. Uh, so, you know, the, the stuff that we can get done in this way, stimulus now, activity for engineers, for constructors, tradies, equipment makers, building materials makers, retailers, that stimulus is badly needed, uh, with the shadow of recession extending well beyond the activities most subject to health restrictions, and it's going to pay a dividend in lower long-term unemployment and all the social and economic costs that that has and a faster rebound. But the other longer term benefits that we get, so energy bills will be lower. That means more competitiveness for business, less anxiety for households. Uh, upgraded buildings are cooler in summer, warmer in winter. They'll cut the toll uh, of cold snaps and our increasing number and intensity of heat waves for human life and health. Lower and more controllable demand will strengthen our energy systems and squeeze more value from existing assets and ease the absorption of cheap, but as uh, the chief scientist noted uh, earlier today, variable renewables. Uh, and cutting energy use cuts greenhouse gas emissions and eases our path to net zero. So, you know, efficiency upgrades are not the only thing we should be doing to lift ourselves up out of the, the Rona recession but they are a big, big opportunity. And that's why we are so enthusiastic. Thank you, Tennant. Uh, a full-throated endorsement of the, of the agenda and a good explanation of, about, about why you're on the field advocating for, for this agenda day, day in and, and day out. Um, we have one last uh, panelist uh, to, to chat to um, before we, we open it up. And I would encourage you all that uh, everyone listening in at home, um, we do have a Q&A tab. Um, you can you can click on that. You can submit a question, and, and my team is, is monitoring those and, and is going to be feeding some of them through to me to to put to our uh, our august panel. Um, but Alison, I like to see I like to think of the Australian Energy Foundation as a as a machine for taking community level energy transition and and scaling it up. So um, I regard you as a bit of an expert on how we might really ramp up effort when it comes to energy efficiency improvements, particularly when it comes to residential and, and, and small businesses. Uh, do you want to sp spend a, a little bit of time um, talking to me about how we might do that, how we might take uh, take all of the wonderful things that we've heard over the last 15 minutes or so and actually get some action happening on the ground? Yeah, thanks, Luke, and thanks for having me here. And congratulations on the report ACOS and all the partners we were really pleased to be supporting that as well. Um, I knew that if I came to this conference, I'd have to have a few numbers because you pretty Love good numbers. <laughs> so I just thought I'd sort of touch um, AF turns 20 this year, um, which is quite remarkable for our organisation. But last year we supported 7,500 homes with energy advice. That was a lot of conversations with a lot of people. Over the last three years, we've actually managed 5,000 energy efficiency upgrades across New South Wales and Victoria. But we've been thinking, um, what do we really need to do right now? And how does the energy efficiency sector have a shovel ready project? So we've been thinking about the fact that 46% of Australians are currently working from home. In Victoria, residential energy consumption has gone up by about 27% since this time last year. We haven't even got to really the start of winter yet. Mm. So that's really, really concerning for us. So we've been thinking about how do we use our existing services, which we have an energy advice centre, to scale that up and help households straight away. So we've designed a bit of a program which we think is going to be quite effective. It's ready to go. And it needs to be ready and up and running by September. Because we know that September is at a critical time in what's going to happen in our country. JobKeeper is planned to come off. Most households will get their first energy bill post winter. And um, I guess the, the rules around you know, non, no, not disconnecting households will be lifted at that point in time as well. 
So we've thought, what if we could provide an energy advice phone service to every Australian, and that program was funded, what would that look like in terms of investment? What would that look like in terms of injection back into the economy? And how many jobs could that create? So we've been doing a bit of a work. I'll give you some more numbers, Luke, because I know you like them. So if we were to look at an investment of about $19.5 million, um, we believe that through those conversations we would have with 2% of Australians, so just 2% of Australians took up a free call to Energy Advice Centre, and we agree with Cass, the number we usually get of helping a bill savings for a household per year is about $277. So we've, we've proven that over the years. That's, that's the average. Um, some households can get more. You can do that through behaviour change. You don't actually need to go and purchase anything within your home. Just through education and behaviour change, you can typically get about $277 off your bill and noting whether you're on the right plan and the right discounts. So for 19.4 million, we reckon we can inject 232 million back into the economy within the next nine months, create 3,800 jobs and deliver $72 million worth of bill savings to those households. So what that looks like is 166 households across Australia would receive that. Um, they get that free call for an energy assessment. We do a virtual energy assessment over the, over the phone we'd look at the bill and we'd send you out information to how to change your behaviour. Over the last eight years that we've been running this Energy Advice Centre, we know that one in five people who ring us actually go on to purchase a product. So we know 16% go on to look at solar, 2% go on to look at insulation, 1% go on to a hot water heat pump and 1% to reverse cycle air conditioning. So if you start to look at what that means in terms of bill savings back into people's pockets to actually pay for their their uh, meals and to actually survive as a family. Uh, and that injection back into the economy, we think, we think that's the best shovel ready energy efficiency project going around. And yeah, look, Alison, I, I think that's, that's all incredibly exciting. And it, it underlines to me um, that there are um, initiatives, projects, ideas out there from your organisation and, and from others that are, that are ready to go, that are properly scoped, that are leveraging um, um, NGOs and, and businesses that um, have have good quality assurance in place have have relationships in in different states, um, and all it, and all it requires is a partner in government to to ramp up that activity. Um, would you ag agree with that, Cass? Thanks, Luke. Um, look, great to see you, Alison. Great to see you, Cass. <laughs> we're just, we're what, just bringing bringing actually, bringing people like together here at uh, the, the national summit. <laughs> I always say it's in the doing that we prove it and we build the support. You know. Yeah. Um, and that's so, you know, so great to hear. Um, and I think we have to call out the elephant in the room, you know, the pink bats part of this and yep. that um, we have to, um, for all the right reasons, demonstrate that we we all learn lessons. We're capable of actually improving what gets done and fixing, you know, things that, that um, weren't quite right back then. And that's why um, this detailed proposal that we've developed is has the right checks and balances in place and the arm's length decision making. So, for example, um, in with the part of the proposal that is about um, getting in place um, the kind of investments, dollars, behaviour changes, as you say, Alison, to, to reduce the size of the energy bill, that audit would be done through partners um, you know, the local government and community housing providers yep. um, so that there is an arm's length process um, unlike um, that previous scheme where the rebates were direct to household, direct to providers of um, the retrofitting. Um, and we've got all these great examples. I mean, the Brotherhood of St. Lawrence as well, Uniting, Good Shepherd, all members of ACOS, they've all been doing this kind of thing. Again, um, it's absolutely in the proving that we can um, get the kind of right investments, the right controls. This is typically going to be about partnership between federal and state and territory governments. But frankly, we can ask for partners and then we can get the leaders, you know? Yep. So um, we, um, I think collectively today, it's another chance for us to push to get, you know, who's going to jump out in front and provide the kind of scale and demonstrate the kind of jobs growth and outcomes that we, we've we definitely proved here in the doing that's been discussed already. Thanks, Luke. Yeah, look, and, and could I, I just add there? Sure. Um, many people may have missed this, but a couple of weeks ago, the federal government announced an energy efficiency grants program 
uh, for uh, upgrades for dairy farmers uh, specifically mm. within the energy efficiency communities program. It's only $10 million, but uh, applicants have got to attest that they're using appropriately licensed tradies and they're installing kit that passes muster on standards mm -hmm. and regulation. In other words, the government is using sensible tools to avoid the risks that have bedeviled you know, the home insulation program while getting useful projects done. So that's great. And the next step is to broaden the scope and raise the scale. Uh, $10 million is not, not that big in the context of the dairy farming sector, let alone um, the breadth of opportunities across the Australian economy and the scale of the economic crisis that we're facing. So you know, we, we can learn from the past uh, and uh, the, uh, the problems of the home insulation program uh, are not, do not mean that we're doomed to repeat those mistakes forever. Well, quite the contrary. When you look at insulation programs around the world, it's actually an unusual example um, of, of relatively poor implementation. And there are many, many um, examples of, of fantastic success. Um, we don't have to look very far. We just look across the, across the ditch to New Zealand and they've had an insulation prog program um, that's been rolled out to, to great effect. Um, and, and you make a great point, Tennant, that, um, you know, the federal government, has programs that could be scaled up. State governments have programs that could be scaled up. Um, Cass and Ellison have pointed to others in the in the not-for-profit sector that um, are already on the ground and, and, and could be partners in this effort. We probably need all of those things in some ways. If you think about a broad-based effort on energy efficiency, different models are gonna work in different parts of the economy. Um, but the, the good news for any public servants that uh, 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 have sneakily listening to, to Zoom on their smartphones because they've been blocked by uh, their departments um, is that they've got, you've got a lot of, uh, you've got a lot of uh, options uh, to hand if, you, if this is a, an agenda that you want to pick up and run with. And I think that's really right, Luke. So, you know, if you're designing a package for social housing, it's clearly got a whole different set of actors and players and levers and funding opportunities, which is quite different from designing something for shopping centres or for or for education or for existing um, homeowners. So that's what makes it quite complicated. But the the really important thing is that the 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 prize is big. The prize is big if you look at it from emissions point of view because it's a quarter of Australia's emissions. A quarter of Australia's emissions without the politics that exists in, in the diabolical politics, which is bedeviled uh, resolution of these issues. Uh, it, it, it also, so the, the, the prize is big, um, but, but also the prize is big in terms of uh, an economic efficiency point of view or economic dividend point of view, because, because you know, we need those jobs now, We're looking for things to do which have good multipliers. Um, you know, I think one of the lessons from the GFC in terms of some of the stimulus there was, was also trying to make the stimulus quite broad based. Some of that stimulus wasn't as broad based as it could have been. So, so um, you know, it, it's important to learn lessons. And, and so the more you can find these, these things that, are, that provide broad based support, then, then that's what you should be focusing on. And, and this is one of those. Oh, Cass, you want to jump in? Just also in the, so the fundamentals of what we need right now and as soon as possible in terms of economic recovery, mm -hmm. it's jobs and incomes being spent. You know, the real 101 of demand-led recovery. Yep. Um, that's what businesses need. And, of course, reducing the size of energy bills, you know, that uh, between three, 300 to over 1,000 per year, that's not nothing. I mean, government mm -hmm. stimulus packages involve that kind of one-off cash stimulus. That, you know, mm -hmm. these are real dollars that will, when they're um, in the hands of people on low and modest incomes, as we've, you know, seen from all the research coming through in this recovery, um, they're getting spent. Yeah, it's a, it's a fantastic point, Cass, and one that's uh, not often remarked on is that um, energy efficiency, you, you're moving spending away from energy bills to other parts of the economy. Um, in America, the American Council of, of, uh, for en Energy Efficient Economy um, actually counts the extra jobs that are created by those, the spending in the other parts of the economy um, mm -hmm. towards the, the, ben the jobs benefits of energy efficiency, because as we know, traditional generation is, is pretty jobs poor. Um, so, you know, there are broader and long-term and lasting economic benefits by, by taking them away from relatively jobs-poor parts of the economy to, to much, much more jobs-rich parts of the economy. 
And of course, the energy concession side of this is something that gets talked about a lot. And, you know, state and territory colleagues mm. are on this summit, and we've got to try and improve the design there. But we know that take up of that is nowhere near as embedded in behaviour as, you know, straight up cash assistance, social security payments, um, and then reducing your spending mm. on something, you'll spend it on something else. And you would reduce emissions instead of perversely saying keep spending, you'll get a concession for it. All right. Well, um, we've got a we've got a question which my team has lobbed up to me from the uh, from the Q and A tab, which is around the home builder program uh, that was announced uh, probably three or four weeks ago now by the federal government. Um, obviously uh, uh, focused on supporting um, renovations as well as new builds, um, but given the context and the and the topic of today's conversation. Uh, does the panel feel that that, uh, that investment could have been a little bit better, better targeted to pick up some of these opportunities? I'm just going to leave that one open. Who would like to take it? I'll jump in. Um, the home builder, the new housing component of it, actually we support, although I believe that there's a few technical details get from that to consider that. I mean, the renovation bit wasn't really an idea that was generated for, by the property council, but it absolutely could have had a link to an energy efficiency and it's sort of the, the, the uh, well suited to do that. One, one of the challenges in this space goes back to what I was talking about before is how do you measure it? So yes, you can pick a winner and say, and that's you know, what Pink Bats did back in the day, said, okay, here's a, here's a winner. So you could have, a, have a, a, something that, that, um, that did that from an outcome point of view uh, but you can't actually say we uh, we will give you a a a grant for taking your home as a part of a renovation from a from a you know two star to a three star or a four star because there isn't a star system. <laughs> so mm, you know mm, it, mm. It, it shows how if you have that sort of anchor policy, it can be leveraged for for a number of different things. But look, the fact that we've got home builder in the form it's, it's got doesn't preclude anything that I think any of the panelists are talking about in terms of other options. Um, nothing wrong. In fact, everything right with stimulating housing construction is clearly mm -hmm. a need to do that. Um, but there's, there's, you know, government hasn't just got one, one bullet to fire here. There's, there's clearly a range of different support measures and stimulus measures it will need to do and is looking at. Uh, and this is this is this is a good one to put alongside a home builder. So, yeah, not necessarily an either or loop. Well, certainly that's the case. And um, with the Grattan Institute out on Monday, so sort of ballparking it and saying, well, there's probably another seventy or ninety billion dollars of stimulus um, that we need to spend here in Australia to keep the show on the road. Uh, it, it's not, as you say, it's not an, an either or. I've got other questions, but does anyone want to uh, chime in on home builder? Just, I was just oh, going to say, you this. both want to chime in. Let's go with. <laughs> Let's go with Cass and then we'll go to Alison. I was going to say, can you slow down? Um, your broadband speed was slowing down when you were backing in home buyers. I went, excellent, because we didn't <laughs> like it at all. We didn't like it at all. Um, but no, <laughs> in, the, uh, in the, um, the days after, we tried to at least put some requirement to demonstrate energy efficiency into anything that was going to get done. So, you know, you've got to seize the, the opportunities. We'd have much rather have seen something that was more targeted on social housing. And again, as I say, having that determination that anything we build now is the best we can do because we've had many experiences of, you know, low cost housing getting built and actually it's really expensive to live in it. Um, but here we are, you know, we'll see what Home Buyers does. Um, if there's scope for influencing on that front, great. But otherwise, um, I think we, we keep this message pretty simple um, that um, it's a really decent package with, with unlike Home Buyers, where we all would love this kind of package to be supported. And that's hopefully also what the politicians might be looking for this time around, broad mm. support. Mm. Well, uh, I see Tennant wants to chime in as well. So I'll go to Alison and, and then we'll close with Tennant on this, on this one. Thanks, Luke. I think um, from us, it's really about what is the most broad reaching program um, that will actually help everybody. Mm. So what we, you know, we've been thinking about, and I mentioned the, the timing before in September, um, that's really critical for us because whilst there's a lot of people now who are living in energy poverty, there's going to be people who go into energy poverty in September who've never ever thought that they would be in that situation. Yep. We're, what we want to do is make, we make sure our program reaches the most people and it's equitable and that's that's actually really important for us so i agree that there needs to be some some paid programs we've heard about dairy we've heard about um homes but actually 
we want to reach as many people as possible. We know that there's going to be a massive issue around people accessing services. The, the program that we've designed would actually require all of us to be partners as well. We would see that there'd be a central number that people would ring in. We'd be more referring people to financial programs where they can get rebates, where they can go for social service support. So it actually needs a whole industry approach and it needs to touch as many people as possible. So um, yes, that's a program, but let's look at this about the reach and how we can help more Australians in a really critical time. Well, certainly you and, and Cass have both pointed to the fact that uh, the, the ranks of what we would describe as, as vulnerable Australians are, are going to be rising, unfortunately, over the next six to 12 months. And, and that, uh, that cliff that you're pointing to, it's looking like a bit of a cliff at this stage. We'll see where the government eventually lands with, you know, how, uh, hopefully a, a ramp down, in my view, at least, of, of, of JobKeeper rather than a, than a hard stop. Um, but anyway, it, it, we're gonna, this is going to be with us for a while, and so we need to be thinking pretty broadly, I would have thought, in terms of the support that we're providing across the community. Tenant? Yeah, I would just look briefly add, um, some people's criticism of the, uh, the Home Builder program was that it was too targeted, that the mm. uh, conditions on it meant that not much would actually happen. It's probably best seen as a toe in the water. It's mm. uh, a, a starter commitment in a space where... There are a lot of houses in mm, Australia mm, that could mm, be upgraded. Mm. Uh, government uh, would be nervous about uh, making a, a commitment that winds up costing it much, much more than it thinks it wants to spend at the moment. Uh, they have, if they want it, the flexibility to vary those conditions uh, over time, both to increase the reach of it and potentially to target it uh, to uh, drive more uh, efficient uh, upgrades. Uh, although, as, uh, as Ken said, there are some practical difficulties in expressing what is, uh, what is sought in a, in a way that is easy for uh, the householders and, and others to, uh, to know that they're complying with and for the government to measure. So there's, there's more work to do. I wouldn't regard that as the final word in this space at all. Tenant, I might stay with you because we've been talking in a sort of a, a fairly siloed sector by sector um, style around these various opportunities. But um, we're very conscious at the Energy Efficiency Council that there are, there are linkages, say, between uh, a, a major um, renovation program um, for, for commercial buildings and homes and, and the demand that might create in the, the manufacturing sector. Do you want to just unpack that? Yeah, so look, there are two uh, big synergies that are on our minds, uh, the materials link and the jobs link. So retrofits in any sector uh, of the economy are going to boost manufacturing through increased demand for building products, for basic materials, for appliances and equipment. Uh, and some of that uh, stimulus will be felt by uh, overseas suppliers, some by local suppliers, retailers uh, locally and everybody in the supply chain will will experience that too but equally stronger activity in manufacturing and in construction flows through to uh, better employment outcomes for uh, for a whole lot of people in australia and uh, reduced financial stress uh, on a lot of households so uh, it's it's not the case that you know the the only thing in this space that matters to manufacturers is help for manufacturers mm. to upgrade themselves. And it certainly shouldn't be the case that the only thing that benefits households likewise is, is help to cut their own bills. Mm. Uh, we're all part of an economy and a society together uh, and uh, efficiency action in one area will have benefits for others. And that's even without considering the benefits that all energy users will derive from uh, an energy system that is uh, better able to handle peaks and better able to handle the variability of uh, what is increasingly going to be the dominant uh, sources of energy into the system. Oh, you're absolutely right. And, and as we head into a, a decade tenant in which we're, we're contemplating the wholesale replacement of vast swathes of our generation and network infrastructure, sort of cost effective opportunities to take a load off the off the grid might be one, might be something we'd want to take up. Did yeah, anyone absolutely. else want to cover it sort of talk to those sort of interrelationships between the sectors before I move on to another question? 
All right. Well, um, there are there is a there is a bubbling uh, pot of ideas uh, uh, on the boil um, uh, down in the Q and A tab, and some of those are being fed through to me. And um, we've got uh, one of our con contributors harkening back to the Howard government and a, a program called Solar Cities, um, which encouraged energy efficiency as well as installing solar. And there was a there was a work work done with about seven municipalities around the country. Um, it actually reminds me a little bit, um, Ken, um, uh, of, of what's been achieved in terms of that, that sort of targeted action on the ground with, um, with city deals. Um, um, so the question to the panel is, look, is that sort of model, a, a sort of national government partnering with um, municipalities around the country? Um, the, the, uh, the, the question um, here is, is it time to dust off that program and extend it to every city council area in Australia? Oh, look, I'm sure we've got to give it a new name. <laughs> Somebody's going to announce that they're going to want to take credit for it as sure. a brand, <laughs> brand new, bright and shiny new. We can work with that, can't we all? Yeah. Um, and I do think we can, We see, we know that, of course, this is the, the challenge of a federa federa federation structure. Mm. Um, part of what we, we push for, of course, is the um, minimum mandatory standards in terms of um, rental properties to provide the right lever for um, homeowners to be able to do their bit in terms of the financing associated with that. And in the proposal that's being shared in the chat there, we sort of propose some transitioning towards that, Ken, you know, don't go away. We want it. We need it. And now with sort of what we're seeing um, um, with the likely, as you say, Alison, very high numbers of people now who are going to be really struggling to cover the basics of housing costs, et cetera, and transition, you know, desperation around rental situations. Um, we've got to make sure that we can get this, confidence that it's the right move overall for a community but we've got until we get some kind of mandating of standards it's going to be hard to get the scale that we mm. can see so this mm. thing of kind of a, a you know another kind of compact which is about um, you know the role of the states because that's about tenancy laws the role of the commonwealth and private sector in terms of the financing arrangement the role of local government in making it easier for approvals etc is pretty key mm. Um, but it's not impossible to do it. And so by showing we've done good stuff in the past, again, you know, it helps to, to um, build confidence that um, we're at the moment, there's a lot of concern about just the basics of businesses trying to survive. And that's very yes. real. Um, we've got to know that um, if, if we come up with something that's quite big, that it's got a high level of support and backing because we yes. can't afford a lot of... Um, uh, descending into old debates, I guess. So I'm a bit worried about that. I'm a massive fan of not descending into old debates. <laughs> I've been stuck, stuck in them for the last decade, yeah. Cass. Um, look, uh, the thing that occurs to me that um, is relevant for, for that comment is that we're sort of looking at a few, few different timeframes here. So you've got the immediate time frame of stimulus, yeah. which is the next six to 12 months, which is kind of appropriately the, the laser-like focus of, of government right now. But in terms of that longer term trajectory and that, that, that greater ambition of uh, this being the start of a process of a significant upgrade to Victoria's building stock and the energy productivity and manufacturers and all the rest of it, you know, we've got to sort of have a, a medium and a long-term time horizon here as well. Um, how, do, how does the panel, and I'm happy for any of you to jump in, think about those, those different time horizons and, and how we should be characterising that to, to government at a time when, you know, I'll be frank, uh, bandwidth's pretty low. I can see ten, tenants, uh, tenants putting his hand up, guys. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of going to him. I don't know if I want to start a classroom here, but uh, he's <laughs> getting a bit of attention. from <laughs> Tenants. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of uncertainty, obviously, in the, uh, still in the pandemic and the economic fallout. We've gone in the last few weeks from feeling like we were almost out of the woods on health. I think, I think a lot of people had that feeling to sobering reminder that the virus is still here and it's still ready to spread. Uh, I'm not feeling very popular as a Victorian right now. Um, but... Um, so the economic data, it's gone from surprising strength to disastrous plunge to slower decline. We, we need to keep in mind what we don't know and be ready to adjust. 
But that said, we've got um, still ahead of us, like a year or more of abnormal health conditions and a cycle of waxing and waning restrictions to manage that. Uh, the direct impacts on travel, tourism, uh, hospitality, education, they're gonna remain serious. International tourism may not recover or, or you know, show signs of recovery until the northern summer of 2022, we're told. Um, so the, the ripples of those direct impacts are spreading across the economy. Households and businesses are responding by cutting costs, uh, deferring or cancelling investment wherever they can. The immediate economic support measures that have been the focus, they're doing, you know, despite some hiccups, uh, we would say a fine job of dampening the impacts of all of that. But some of the jobs and some of the businesses preserved by those measures will simply not be there when those measures end, whenever that is. And the flow through of bankruptcies, defaults, unemployment to the wider economy risks further disruption. So delayed investment, lower demand, unemployment, all have consequences that last well beyond the pandemic itself. Some activity is clearly coming back as, as and when we're able to ease restrictions, but for health and economic reasons, we're almost certainly not gonna have a V-shaped recovery that's quick and easy. We're gonna need sustained active policy to help Australians recover. The mix of that policy is gonna to have to shift from hibernation measures that have kept people and businesses in place during the first phase to stimulus measures that support overall activity and help people and businesses take up new opportunities. So, you know, we're not gonna have a hard cutoff from, uh, from one phase to the other. We will have, uh, a handover over an extended period between those. Mm. Do others want to chime in on that question? Ken? Yeah, I think it, it's um, as difficult as it is if we were putting the pandemic to one side and saying, you know, that, that longer term time frame, what do we need to do? Then absolutely we do need policies which which drive us for the longer term. And when you when you look at the issue of um, of carbon abatement you don't have to do it in a week you just have to continually do it um, uh, and that's why governments have set long-term targets and have you know interim intermediary targets to along the way so that's what we need to do so you do need to have uh, the measures that help you do that and to give governments uh, some some credit one of the things that we have been able to convince them to do is to uh, agree to a trajectory of upgrades to building codes uh, to the National Construction Code does mm. address that that issue uh, Cassandra raised earlier. Um, so, uh, and they've started with commercial and, and residential will be in the next upgrade. So that's good. And you know what the, the argument we've made to them, which they've accepted is that rather than lurching from unknown upgrade to unknown upgrade, let's have a trajectory of known changes which are going to occur in the future. And then if you're a, a manufacturer or a developer or a builder, you can you know what's likely to happen in two or three or four years time mm -hmm. and you can position yourself on that change curve and say, well, I want to be off, um, offering product or, or, or an outcome which, which, uh, which will fit the market in five years time, not just next week. So that's important as are incentives uh, and you want incentives to be there to to pull through activity which would otherwise not happen and to incentivize the leaders to keep going and keep innovating and keep doing great stuff and and one of the things that we have which is a real asset for australia when we're thinking about this topic is we have in the top end australian property marketplace you know some of the the, the best players in the world um mm the best performers in the world. And, and um, you know, that's been recognized by the, the GRES uh, rating assessment of, of um, sustainable property companies for the last uh, eight years running, I think, Australia and New Zealand, uh, you know, beats North America, beats Asia, beats Europe, hands down uh, in terms of its performance there. So we've got some great skills, some great expertise, but it's not spread through the built environment sufficiently. And that's one of the big challenges we've got. Alison, you had a, a final thought. Yeah, I've been thinking um, as we're and listening to my my co-panelist, and 
there is some absolute urgency around reducing spend and stimulus into the economy, which I think we can do within a very short period of time. Um, but that will be different for every different part of Australia and it'll be different for every different Australian. And one, one sort of people we haven't spoken about today is renters and their inability to upgrade their homes um, without solving the split incentive issue between landlord and tenant. Uh, so there definitely needs to be some, some really um, speedy reform around how to do with renters because um, there, there are a group of people that are often left out of when we consider you know, inclusion into all of these programs. Um, the other, other element that I've been thinking about as we've been talking is, and, and, and as um, AEF that was METHL at the time delivered solar cities, um, we do need to have a really uh, rigorous program around our partnership rights throughout that supply chain. As someone who's delivered a lot of thermal upgrades with insulation over the last couple of years, um, I can tell you that it's, it's critically important. I never would have thought I'd know so much about encapsulated wiring as I do. But um, it is so critical that we have the right partners. It is so critical that we have the right programs targeted to the right people who need those. Um, and there will be a lot of people who need finance. So the one thing we could also do is accelerate the um, rollout of residential and environmental upgrade finance um, and make that accessible really quickly. Um, but we don't want financing options that actually put people into further debt. So we don't want loans um, that actually people have to pay back. We need proper economic stimulus right now in a whole different way for um, shaped up for different people. That's rental reduction or whatever that is to get those split incentives to allow every Australian to sort of be in this transition to a net zero country. Well, look, uh, the thing that occurs to me is with those closing comments, Alison, is that um, if we, we reflect on where we are in 2020 versus where we are in, we were in 2008, 2009, um, there's an incredible amount of expertise out there now, a, a deep understanding um, of, of how, how to do this kind of stuff and do it well. Um, uh, the sophistication of, of knowledge of how, how a, a program, a set of programs like this would play out in different parts of the economy, both to, we're outside of government and within government is, is so much higher than it was back then. And um, I suppose it will just take a, 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 some leadership um, some, some courage from government to, to take that step um, of uh, being an active partner to leverage that expertise and, and to unlock some of these huge opportunities. So I want to thank our panel. Um, it's been an incredible conversation. Um, we appreciate working with all of your organisations and all of you personally uh, day in and day out. I'm excited by this vision. As I said at the start of this panel, I'm excited by the, the level of support that this agenda is finding out in, in the community. And um, I'm very hopeful um, that energy efficiency is having its moment and we can, we can get this one across the line. Thank you all. Thanks very much, Luke. See you, everybody. Great to be with you. All right. So uh, we'll now take a short break and uh, stay on the line because I'll be back with Michael Liebreich at 4pm sharp. Thanks. <laughs>